Next case is People versus Alfonso Strader. Oh, the municipal attorneys are getting their pen shot. <laughs> right? Yeah, right. The justice there is on. Give himself a hook now. <laughs> May I proceed? Good morning, Mr. Chief Justice, Your Honors, and may it please the court. I'm Margaret gillis Ielt from the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office, representing Prosecutor Kim Worthy and the people of the state of Michigan. I would like to reserve one minute for rebuttal, uh, and we'll keep track of my time. The people ask this court to either grant their application and answer yes to the three questions posed to the parties or peremptorily reverse the Court of Appeals ruling which vacated defendant's sentence. That court clearly erred by not applying any standard of review and granting relief. Had it done so and applied the correct one, plain error, defendant would not have been entitled to relief. It further erred by not distinguishing the facts in People v. Kabli and People v. Muhammad from this case <coughs> and ignoring People v. Johnson and People v. Walker where this court and the Court of Appeals applied the harmless error rule to violations of the habitual offender notice provision. The harmless error statute in the same chapter of the criminal code as the notice provision governs errors as to any matter of pleading or procedure. A violation of the notice provision falls within these categories. The harmless error statute then is a mandate to this court to deny relief unless the error resulted in a miscarriage of justice. Here it did not. The purpose of the notice provision was satisfied, that is, to notify a defendant at an early stage of the proceeding what sentencing penalties he may face. Defendant had actual notice from the inception of the case that he faced enhanced sentencing at least 28 days before required. Although the people did not file a proof of service, this does not negate the actual notice that either defendant, his counsel, or both received. He cannot identify any harm he suffered, including by receiving important sentencing information early. With that, I invite questions from the court. Counsel, good morning, and I, I just want to start off by asking this question. First off, welcome to our new term, but help me to understand, if this is a policy determination, that this is how you're going to kind of conduct your office. This is an actual policy determination. So it's an affirmative act, which is this is an actual policy. How is it, how, how is it harmless? I mean, I, mean, I mean, the issue here is, I guess my question is, how is it an accident? I'm sorry, how is it what? Well, if we're trying to apply the standard that you're trying to apply, right, how can you do this under a situation where you have an affirmative policy? I mean, how is it harmless error? I guess my question is, how is it harmless error when this is an official office policy to not do this? Where is the error? Right, Your Honor, well, we strongly um, disagree with that. Uh, with that. Um, well, you disagree with it, but with, how is that I'm the sorry, case? with that um, characterization that it's an office policy absolutely is not. We don't take lightly the requirements. We, we've seen of a lot of them, though. They keep coming back from Wayne County. Yes, Your Honor. We, we are aware of that, and we do not take lightly the statutory requirements. However, we remind this court that the statutory requirements are procedural requirements. We have now implemented procedures to remedy that. We recognize that in the past we have um, not complied with certain of the procedural requirements. However, we, it is absolutely not our office policy. We are doing our best to, not, to comply with the statute in terms of the filing and the service and the proof of service. But However, but counsel, this isn't, look, I understand you guys are busy, you have a lot of cases, a lot of things happening. I totally am empathetic to that. This is not the hardest thing to do. I'm trying to understand why this keeps, ha if it's not a policy, why do we keep hearing about this? I mean, this is not, 
this isn't, this isn't a really hard statute to have to follow. I get there's a lot of complications in criminal law that are very challenging and very hard and very cumbersome. This just does not appear to be something that is overly cumbersome for you to follow. And what I'm trying to understand, if it's not a policy, why does it keep happening and why should you be entitled to harmless error? Well, first of all, we're, uh, we, are, we, are, we have been in the process of rectifying these mistakes. So I would suggest to the court that it won't keep, ha it won't keep happening. It, it has stopped and we are in the process of making sure that that continues. Um, why it happened in the past, oversight, um, large dockets, I, I'm not making excuses, but I am trying to answer your question. We are by far the largest county um, in the state of Michigan, um, way, way past the second place of Oakland County. I'm, and again, I'm, I'm trying to be direct with the answer. The AOI courtrooms are flying. The, the docket numbers, the number of cases that the judges are hearing, the prosecutors are flying by those cases. We are now, uh, we're, we're correcting that. But I will point out that the statute is a procedural statute. It doesn't implicate the failure to file the proof of service or, or f follow other procedural requirements within the habitual offender statute. Do not violate due process, which is the right there. Uh, the statute is intended to uh, protect the early notice to the defendant of the habitual offender notice. Um, that is why, in fact, there are two harmless error rules. In fact, one, MCR, I'm sorry, MCL 769.26, right in the same chapter, chapter nine, of the Code of Criminal Procedure. That directly um, points to the fact that it was intended, the legislature did intend that it be a harmless error approach to procedural matters as to any matter of pleading or procedure which the notice statute is. We, in fact, I think our good faith is evident by the fact that we put the habitual notice um, on the information from the inception of the case, um, from the three charging documents, all have them. And in rare instances, it changes, but in the most of the cases, it does not change. And in fact, when it does change, we file an amended information within the 21 days of the AOI. Counsel, uh, I, I've got a little bit tougher <laughs> or not, follow up, follow up to Justice Bernstein. Uh, we keep seeing noncompliance with the statute. You make a good argument that it's harmless error, but you've assured us that the office has changed and that this isn't going to continue. So this is an unpublished opinion of the Court of Appeals. Why should we, given your assurances, why should this, why is, why is this jurisprudentially significant? Why should we do anything? Just let this unpublished case go and accept your representation that the office policy changed and we're not going to see continuous noncompliance with the statute out of Wayne County. And, and let me, can I just you do can. a friendly amendment? Yeah, please. <laughs> or just addition to the question, which is particularly in light of the fact that the Court of Appeals has recently issued a published opinion uh, in People versus Head, finding that this was harmless error. Why is it, in addition to the reasons Justice Sarah gave, why is this case jurisprudentially significant to us anymore? Well, first of all, um, the Court of Appeals here reached the wrong result. So um, in the interest of correcting an incorrect ruling, and um, in this case, defendant now, uh, if, the, if this court does nothing, the case is remanded and the defendant is resentenced um, without habitual offender enhancement. He's a repeat offender. That should not happen. The Court of Appeals applied the wrong analysis. I, I grant you that it's an unpublished opinion, but the result was wrong. Secondly, um, a ruling from this court, even in an order, um, has binding precedential value. If, it's, if you're able to ascertain the ruling and the meaning of the ruling, it has value. And certainly, something more than an order would have even more value. People v. Cobley, um, there's no cite to the harmless error rule. People v. Johnson, there is a cite to the harmless error rules, both of them. Uh, People v. Mohammed, um, 
there is no cite to the harmless error rule. It was remanded for the Court of Appeals to look and see, did the trial court err in dismissing the habitual but offender the, notice? But the Court of Appeals has already gotten to where you want them to get in a published opinion, right? Doesn't that stand as the law in Correct. Michigan unless we do something about it? Well, we would be um, delighted if this court would then adopt the reasoning in, in People v. Head and answer let me, yes let to me the ask three you questions this, Let me ask you here. this question. Um, you said at the beginning that the defendant here had actual notice of the habitual, his habitual offender status. Can you tell me what facts there were in this case that, that you're relying on in making that assertion to us? Yes. Well, first of all, the three charging documents had the official offender notice on them. At the preliminary examination, defense counsel argued against count five, home invasion first. He referenced count five. How would he know it was count five if he didn't have a, a hard copy of the information and, or some charging document in front of them? Any of the charging documents had the habitual offender notice on it. Second, at the AOI, that same defense counsel waived a reading of the information with the habitual offender notice on it. Why would he waive the reading of a document he had not seen? The court referred to the charges at the AOI, again, signaling that it also <coughs> had a copy of the information. But unlike in Head, there was no reference on the record that I found to the actual habitual uh, notice, correct? You're That's just saying because it's on, I'm, I'm sorry? That's not correct, Your Honor. Oh, so the judge referred to the habitual notice or one of the I'm lawyers sorry, did? Uh, yes, at, the, at both sentencings, there were two sentencings, on July 17th and July 23rd, 2015, which by the way is why this needs a remand for a Crosby hearing. But aside from that, there were two references. Well, at the sentencings, that would have been well after the period of notice, right? Isn't it your position that he had actual notice within the period that the statute provides he should have that notice? Right, and, and I'm not suggesting that the sentencing confirms that that was the first time he had actual notice. We're simply saying that's a very strong inference that all the way along that he had the information in hand. There's is no there, reason to think that he did not. Is there anything besides strong inference? We're just trying to, is this a good case for us to, what's your best argument about why we could say in this case that it was harmless? What, what, what in the record can you point to to show that the defendant had actual notice? Well, first of all, the, the standard review here is plain error, not harmless error, but we are, are urging this court to adopt a harmless error globally if it is preserved. Second, um, as I mentioned, there is um, repeat references to the information by defense counsel in, at preliminary examination, at the AOI, um, at the close of the people's <coughs> proofs, when he actually, defense counsel, raises an express concern of the defendant himself about the information, it wasn't signed properly. You're talking about um, the charging documents in the district court, correct? I'm sorry? You're talking about the charging documents in the district court? Uh, no, I'm referring to, the, well, the information is one of the three charging documents in, that originate in the district court that right. take effect once it's bound over. Right, um, do you have anything from the record in the circuit court that you can point to? Well, we have the transcripts, Your Honor. We have the transcripts, the record references to the waiver of the information at the AOI, the close of the people's proofs where the discussion of the of defendant's concerns by his defense counsel of certain uh, irregularities that he thought were in the information, which in fact were not um, valid points. But at that point, there was no reference to the fact that their, um, the habitual information had not been served. This is an unpreserved error. At sentencing, uh, defense counsel references at both sentencings that he's a hab second. Um, so uh, that is strong inferences. I'm, I, I, Counsel, can, yes. I, can I ask a question that I think is subtly different than what my colleagues have asked, but it's uh, very much grounded in what uh, they've been asking you about here. Uh, I understand your harmless error argument. I don't happen to think it's unreasonable by any means. But the, the larger conundrum for this court and the integrity of the justice system is this. You've got the representatives of the people having enacted laws here that prescribe pres specific notification procedures for habituals. But at the same time, there are countless alternative procedures that could be adopted, that could have been adopted, that would achieve similar notice. So we've got a situation in which there's almost always going to be a relevant or cognizable argument that it's harmless when these alternative procedures are followed because each of them, just like the law, <coughs> apprises the defendant in some form or some fashion of the fact 
that there is a habitual complaint that's, uh, that's involved. I find it untenable, A, that we could keep on having the problems that we've had with your, uh, your office in terms of uh, breaching and neglecting to abide by the specific procedures that the legislators of Michigan have given to us, but I would also find it untenable in each of these cases to say it's not jurisprudentially significant that we, we, uh, we recognize that there's been real notice of an alternative form given because the standard is substantial justice. And if there is some alternative form of notice that's been given, there might nonetheless have been substantial injustice, no substantial injustice, even if the uh, specific language of the state law had not been complied with. How do we maintain the integrity of the law and at the same time maintain the integrity of a system that's determined not to release every violent habitual criminal in which there has been a failure of compliance with the language of the law. Do you follow my question? I think I do, Your Honor, and if I'm not answering it correctly, please let me know. I, I think, again, that is where the harmless error um, comes into play, and certainly plain <coughs> in this particular case. Um, if the defendant is not apprised that he faces the possibility of enhanced sentencing within 21 days after the AOI, we lose. He, there's a bright line rule, Ellis and people view Ellis and Morales. There's got to be a reason that um, the legislature and this court implemented a harmless error rule as to matters of pleading and procedure. That's fair enough, but that's one side of the argument. There's also got to be a reason why the legislature enacted this specific procedure as opposed to alternative procedures that might also have communicated uh, some semblance of notice to the defendant. Well, I think the legislature, fairly enough, um, wanted to ensure that the defendant received this very important piece of information. Um, regarding sentencing, possible sentencing penalties. And so it spelled out um, how to do that. Um, we have um, done our best to comply with that, and we haven't done well enough um, in past cases. But we have, on the other hand, gone way overboard in providing the constitutional component, which is the notice. Defendants have always known. How do we maintain the integrity of the statutory system we have in Michigan? Not the one you'd like, not the one they have in the federal system, but our, our law. How do we maintain the integrity of that law if uh, we have to rely on harmless error? Because there are always going to be these alternative notification procedures. Well, Your Honor, just like you want to recognize the, the terms of MCL 769.13, the habitual offender statute, the court also has to acknowledge the very clear language of MCL 769.26. That is also a statute. It sets forth a harmless error review. And that is how you maintain it. There's a balancing act. It's a case by case on the case of the facts, whether it's preserved or not. And you <coughs> we can't overlook the harmless error statute in the same chapter nine of the Code of Criminal Procedure. Counsel, is there a time limit for when the proof of service must be filed? I would say uh, it is not within, um, certainly the statute. I don't think the statute provides a time for filing the proof of service. Right, I think, I, I, I would say that the, the, the filing of the proof of service, if that is the only oversight, could happen after the 21 days. It's not our goal to do that. We don't want to rely on that. That would be a harmless error review of that filing. Um, but I I would not want to rely on that. We, we would, our, our practice now is that we're going to file the proof of service. We have put it on the information itself, <coughs> and it will be filed at the AOI. That is, that is what we are instructing our APAs to do. Thank, Thank you. you. If there's any time, I'm sorry. Thank you, Council. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning, Your Honors, and may it please the court. Christine Pajak, State Appellate Defender's Office, on behalf of Mr. Strotter. Uh, this court has said that it should not be indifferent to time limits set by the legislature. Uh, it could show, uh, this court could show that it's not indifferent to the time limits of this statute by requiring 
that the prosecutor do what the legislature has said that it needs to do in order to enhance sentences, the optional enhancement of a sentence under the habitual offender notice by filing an instrument <coughs> within 21 days after the uh, <coughs> arraignment on the information or the waiver. It is not asking too much to ask them to comply with the plain language of the statute, not by serving it too early, uh, which uh, this court's 180 day rule jurisprudence uh, has said you can serve too early. And in that instance, it's requiring that uh, incarcerated defendants who certainly are not in control of when the MDOC sends out the notice or how they send out the no notice in People versus Henderson in an order this court has said the notice can go out too early. Uh, the rule would be simple and plain and failure to do so uh, would not be uh, subject to the harmless error rule for the reasons uh, we set forth in our in our brief. And <coughs> I waive the rest of my free fire zone at this point. Well, the response of opposing counsel is that we have another law and a court rule that are equally clear, 769.26 and MCR 2.613. Well, there are obviously two, you know, two avenues down which we can go here, and I guess the, the thrust of my question to opposing counsel was it's really untenable to go down the road single-mindedly, down either the road single-mindedly, because there's some damage done either to the intentions of the legislature or to the um, interests of the people in not having, as in this case, a violent, habitual offender return to the streets because there's been some failure of compliance with them, um, you know, a particular statute, but not with another, not with another statute. Well, the in Ray uh, forfeiture of the bail bond speaks to, the, to whether or not the harmless error would apply. But I want to get to the second point that you've made that habitual offenders are going to be returned to the street. That's, that's not actually what happens, right? He's still going to be sentenced. He's still subject the, okay. to the. He's uh, I'm still not subject. trying to argue about it in this case, but it could be. <coughs> the, 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 if it's just that the enhancement wouldn't be available, and I think particularly post Lockridge, right? The guidelines are not uh, mandatory. There are certainly, uh, you know, ways that potentially that it might not be that you could raise the sentences high, but really, it's not asking a lot to require the prosecutor to follow the very laws that they are enforcing. All they have to do is file and serve it within But it's not asking a lot after. of this court to enforce the harmless error rules that say that there's no substantial injustice done to the defendant. You can overlook an acknowledged error. Well, you, that then, of course, would require you to overlook the, the case law in brave bail bonds forfeiture that talks about why that that there is when that the legislature is giving the prosecutor the power to act and by giving them this power they're telling them how to go forth and do it they're not they're not complying with that and the the case law going back to 1850 says that when the legislature tells the an agency how they can go about doing something they're required to go about and do it that way i, I think also if you think about the substantial justice uh, that that requiring them to do it after that the court case has brought over, over to the circuit court as the prosecutor has acknowledged things can change at that point and you've got this statute that was enacted and changed. Initially, it just required prompt service. Then there was Shelton that said it has to be within 14 days. The legislature made a determination to set a bright line rule of 21 days. The legislature in that statute didn't say this is harmless if the legislature doesn't comply with it. And the one part that would not be subject to the harmless error rule would be that timing. That's it. There is no time limit for filing the proof of service, every single litigant is required to do proofs of service. Here to this day, the prosecutor can't say that this was served. The <coughs> reference that the, there was stuff served in the district court, they can say that happened. They can say that they had it by the point of sentencing. But on the day of first day of trial, the reference uh, that the prosecutor was making, the, they don't have the 
first the January 23rd signed copy of the information. In fact, the prosecutor didn't even attach it to her own appendix. I got it from the court file here that they're just not serving it. And that's part of giving the notice. Counsel, can I, um, I, I believe you concede that defense counsel had the charging documents in the district court. So you, I, I, I don't think there's any, I mean, it seems that way. I, I don't know how I could not concede okay. it. So it seems likely, right? It seems likely. So putting aside for a second, you know, the legal question of whether filing too early counts, mm -hmm. it, it, isn't that sufficient to show that the defendant or the defendant had actual notice? The actual notice of what was going on in the district court, of right? The but the circuit court is where the operative criminal charges are going on. He, who knows what the prosecutor decided to do at that point? So the so the fact that it, it's not there's no evidence or there's no way to assume that it was refiled in the circuit court within the time period is still. It was refiled. I mean, it was refiled, but it, there it, there was no I mean, service. Served. The service and the services. I mean, filing is obviously important, right? It, but there yeah, yeah, yeah. all these requirements. But the service part is also important. That's the part that's going to give him notice. He's not supposed to have to go to the court file <clears throat> to see what happened and when it happened, and you know and. And the other thing is, there's no, if you think about, it, think about it in terms of why we require objections, why the court requires objections, it's to allow for the correction of mistakes. That's why there's a harmless error rule, that if you make a timely objection, <coughs> then it can be fixed. But there's no way to fix this. It's either filed and served within 21 days, entirely within the prosecutor's control, or it's not. Can an argument be made that there was a waiver in that at sentencing, at sentencing, defense counsel um, seemed to concede that, that uh, this was a second habitual offender. I think the, the argument would be maybe a forfeiture and not a waiver because the defendant isn't the one doing it. And he certainly is raising it when he gets an opportunity to do so. So he's not give. I mean, I suppose he could have, as part of his allocution, said, wait, it wasn't served on me, I don't know. But he, he's also, you know, service on defense counsel is supposed to count, and he's raising it. He raised it in a standard four brief here. Uh, so it, it, it seems unfair to require him to do more than we're actually requiring the lawyer, so in this case the prosecutors, to, you know, just serve it and do a proof of service. Uh, you know the 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 rules do need to be i think a, at least a little bit fair and and right uh, i would argue due process and and all of that for our defendant here my client uh let me see if i do I have any other questions uh so the record's unclear about whether it was ever served at the circuit court but the record isn't unclear about notice well, note that if, if you're considering like early notice, that there was some sort of early notice in the district court, but the- No, at the, at, at the, the time of trial, is, is, there, is there anything in the record that, that tells us whether there was no notice about the habitual? At the time of trial, uh, there is a reference, I believe, on the first day of trial to what complaint, what information, sorry, what information that the uh, defendant has. They don't seem to have anything uh, in their possession <clears throat> past what was in the district court. There's not, there's a January 23rd, a signed January 23rd uh, information uh, that uh, was filed and I, I don't know. Where I'm going ever with it served. is. The and then there's an April one. The due process concern is notice, correct? Well, the, the prosecutor concedes that there's a due pro that in their brief, they say that it needs to be filed and served within 21 days to comply with the with due process and and notice. And you could get notice, I suppose. And there's there's a lot of reasons why you you know that there's a lot of reasons why that in terms of strategy decisions that the defense is making decisions that the defendant is making in terms of whether or not to plead or to go to trial or right. you know what risks they're facing and so you know requiring the prosecutor to comply with the statute and not 
start going down this road of promptly and whether or not there's notice uh, there's if you look into the look at the history of this the case law that sort of evolved with uh, what's it Shelton and Hendricks and and all of that why there was a problem without having it be a set time limit so the prosecutor is arguing that this is plain error <coughs> prosecutor is arguing uh, prosecutor is arguing that they gave notice that the early notice do you counts. agree that this is plain error uh, I would say if you that it was plain error that the court should have corrected and and that the time frame is is set I, or that the plain error rule applies. I, I just want to make sure I'm understanding your question. You understand? I I, I are you asking me if I'm, the plain I'm asking is this a plain error? I, I think it, I mean I think that it certainly was a plain error. By the court, and and that the the court of appeals certainly reached the right result, and you could disagree with the reason. So we're left with the situation, I assume, after this argument is done, that you argue there was error, and the opposing counsel says, but it was harmless, and if this uh, a similar case comes up to us, fifty more times over the next year, you will be arguing there was error, and you'll be arguing that it was. Um, likely harmless. The conundrum for this court, and I think at least one of the reasons why we've granted in this case, after having a, you know, a few efforts earlier to do, do the same in earlier cases, was to try to understand how we, how we maintain and preserve the integrity of the process, particularly where there are alternative procedures to the ones the legislature set forth that seem to provide some, some minimal amount of notice by an alternative means. So do you have any fur anything further you'd like to but say? I, th I think the, the answer to that is to use this court's jurisprudence about treating the time limits like they matter and applying th the time limit. You'd have to file and serve it within 21 days <coughs> after the arraignment on the information. Not too early, not too late. Yeah, so just there was within error. that 21 there was error. days. There was error. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. You call that the Goldilocks rule? It is the Goldilocks rule. Yeah. You have one minute to go, please. Thank you, Your Honor. To answer your question, um, time limits, or I'm sorry, to re respond also to opposing counsel, time limits do matter to the people. In fact, that is why we give the defendant his due process notice early from the initiation of the case. Council cites to the 180 day rule, which is in a uh, different chapter. It's not even in the code of criminal procedure. And that, um, that is a completely distinct situation, um, not analogous to this at all. That triggers a requirement that something happen after that hundred, within that 180 days. The notice provision is simply notifying the defendant. And same with the bail bond statute, different chapter of the code um, and different parties involved. You've represented to us that the policies in the office have changed. I said it's an unpublished opinion. Justice Viviano pointed out the, the case of uh, People v. Head, which is a published opinion, albeit a per curiam opinion. Yes. Given all that, why should this court put its resources into issuing an opinion when it appears that binding law from the Court of Appeals is going to take care of this matter? Well, uh, then we would ask the court to um, deny leave on, on people v. Head, which is it's currently pending in this court. And we would um, ask the court to peremptorily reverse, at a minimum, the Court of Appeals ruling in this case, which vacated the defendant's <coughs> sentence. The, the result that the Court of Appeals reached here was wrong, and it was um, the law that it failed to apply in contrast was also wrong. So, so because er of that, you want us to error correct? We want you. We want the court to error correct. Yes, and certainly um, this court has done so in the past through many peremptory uh, reversals and orders. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you both. Case will be referred. Taken under advisement.